Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining our ninth Urban Shift webinar. My name is Margot Genesti, and I work on integrated and sustainable urban development at the UN Environment Programme. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this event today, where we will explore the causes and consequences of plastic pollution in cities and what cities can do to initiate a just transition to a plastic-free economy. Before we get started and I leave the floor to my colleagues, let me just run through a bit of housekeeping. This webinar will be moderated in English with some interventions in Spanish. Interpretation in English, Spanish and French will be available. You can enable it by clicking interpretation at the bottom of your screen and selecting the language that best suits you. Second, we would welcome any question you have for any of our speakers about about uh, uh, their project or about the program itself. So please post these in the Q&A box as shown on the slide. Over to you, Sharon. Thank you, Margot. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Sharon Hill, and I lead the work on sustainable urban development at the UN Environment Program. For those of you who don't already know, um, Urban Shift is an initiative funded by the Global Environment Facility and led by the UN Environment Program in partnership with the World Resources Institute, C40 Cities, ICLE, and the United Nations Development Program, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and other partners. So it's really a big collaborative um, uh, network. Urban Chef focuses on transforming 23 cities in nine countries through integrated urban planning approaches and building capacity to shift to greener and healthier economies. So for the next hour, we will have a series of presentations and discussions from experts and city stakeholders and representatives, particularly from the informal sector about the challenges City space to tackle the plastics crisis. You'll also learn about the landmark UN led resolution and plastic pollution towards an international le legal binding instrument and the process for developing a global plastics treaty, where we in UNEP really believe that cities have a big role to play. Today, we will kick off the discussion with an overview from my colleague, Nao Takeuchi the waste, a waste management expert at UN Habitat. Her intervention will focus on the challenges cities are facing globally regarding plastics, as well as some of the actions that can be put into place. This keynote will be followed by in interventions from four distinguished speakers. We are very grateful uh, for our speakers here today. Actually, we will have five distinguished speakers, apologies for that. Um, as my uh, colleague Margot indicated, um, we will finish with the Q&A, so please write down your questions to our plan panelists in the Q&A box. So, not to eat all of the airtime, we are all eager to learn more about the strong but this complex uh, relationship between plastics pollution and city. So I, I will hand it over now to my colleague now. Um, now, what are the challenges and opportunities that cities and local governments are facing on the issue of plastics pollution? The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, seems like the picture that you picked is a little bit different person, but anyway. Uh, so um, I would like to make a presentation about the uh, uh, cities and plastic pollution today and an overview and implications from uh, SDG indicate 11.6.1 monitoring and the role of cities in reducing plastic pollution. Next slide, please. And then I, I my name is Nao Takeuchi. I'm also, I'm working for UN Habitat for the waste management team uh, for the past uh, uh, seven years. And then I was, I have been, um, in, in the waste management sector for almost 10 years. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much for uh, having me. Next slide, please. 
So before going into the detail, I would like to introduce this Waste by Cities tool, which is a monitoring methodology of SDG indicator 11.6.1, uh, measuring the proportion of municipal solid waste collected and managed in control facilities out of total municipal solid waste generated by the city. And the UN Habitat has, is a custodian agency for, for this indicator, mandated for monitoring uh, of this uh, indicator. And then therefore we developed the monitoring methodology and then launched it in February 2021. Um, and since then, we've been applying this uh, more than about like 50 cities and this is a quite a strong evidence-based action planning tool for sustainable municipal solid waste management for cities. And then based on, uh, sorry, could you go back to the uh, slide? And then this is, uh, uh, we use all this collected data for estimating the global estimation for the, the SDG indicator and, and conducted in 2022. Next slide, please. So this is the result of the, uh, uh, the, the global estimate. And as you can see, the cities are struggling with providing the quite municipal solid waste. And the orange one, orange bar is showing the amount of the municipal, uh, the percentage of the uh, municipal solid waste collected and managed in control facilities. And then the green one is collection coverage. And as you can see the world, is still like struggling to manage the solid waste, solid waste globally. So almost 45% is mismanaged. And these are becoming the uh, biggest, one of the biggest uh, um, leakage source of the plastic, I would say. And then as you can see that the mismanaged, uh, uh, basically the, the collection coverage, the last mile of the collection coverage is almost mostly in slums. So those are uh, the slums and then also the mismanaged based, based management facilities are identified as a major plastic pollution source. Next slide, please. So based on this, we have found out that this is a new kind of estimates, which is slightly higher than the uh, last year's World Bank estimation, about 2 0.4 billion tons of municipal solid waste generated in 2018. And then why this is a little bit higher uh, than the World Bank's estimate is because that uh, we really found out that waste generation per capita in Africa is much higher than the World Bank's uh, estimate. Hope 45% of which is managed in uncontrolled facilities. So cities are struggling with providing adequate municipal solid waste management. Next slide, please. And this is resulting into the mismanagement of plastic waste and pollution. About like uh, 400 million tons of plastic waste generated worldwide, according to the UNEP's estimate, I think. And then it, of which 28 8 million tons uh, of, is coming from municipal solid waste stream, which is making up almost 75% of the total plastic waste generation. So here you really see that the magnitude of municipal mismanagement of municipal solid waste here to the pollution of the plastic. So, and then 60 million tons of plastic per year from municipal solid waste is polluting the environment that this our estimate is telling in terms of the statistics. Next, next slide, please. So, and this is also some a little bit of statistics that we take out from this SDG 1161 monitoring uh, about the plastic recycling in cities. So most of the plastic recycling, especially in low to middle income countries are not subsidized at all, relying on a market mechanism and informal waste sector heavily. And an average recycling rate of the plastic waste is about 12.3% of total plastic waste generated. And then the most recycled plastics are PET and HDPE, with a few cities recycling LDPE. So almost no cities have capacity to recycle PP, EPS, and PVC. So it's really like telling that the story that which, which plastic types has got the recycling market, which is not. And and, and end up being in the environment polluting the environment. Next slide, please. And then also what we have found out through, through our survey in the, uh, Kenya and Uganda and on the access to basic waste collection services. And 
this really shows the plastic pollution is really disproportionately affects the urban poor. As you can see that the, the, this uh, uh, graph, uh, uh, our survey, household survey on access to basic waste collection services in Kenya and Uganda found out that about like 90% of the people living in the slums do not have access to basic waste collection services, while that 60-70% of uh, people living in non-slum areas has got access to basic and improved solid waste management uh, collection services, meaning the uncollected waste uh, is, is really happening in slums and, and those impoverished areas and affecting the public health, people's health, uh, quality of life in those people, in the urban poor. So the plastic pollution is really disproportionately affects the urban poor. Next slide, please. And then also, this is another aspect of the poverty uh, related to waste management. Informal waste sector is trapped in poverty, disproportionately affected by plastic pollution. And then, uh, as our report uh, highlighted, about conservative estimates suggested that the informal waste sector consists of about 15 million people, recovering up to almost 60% of recycled waste globally. And then many of the, them are women youth and often children and then their their working environment and then uh, is very unhealthy and hazardous and then there's a lot of health impacts and hazardous materials and then children often miss schools to meet their daily ends and many of them are trapped in the cycle of poverty next slide please so there there here comes the cities uh, uh, the cities the role is tremendous in reducing, reducing and tackling the plastic pollution. And for the waste collection expansion, cities will be the implementer. So to turn, turn the open dump sites to sanitary landfill sites, the city is the implementer to do this work. Establishing MRFs and reverse logistics, also the city is gonna be the implementer. And then the, the providing ideas and access to social protections, uh, awareness raising for behavior change, waste management stakeholders engagement, all those work to be done through the municipal solid waste management will be, the city is gonna be the center and at for, forefront of establishing those systems. This is uh, something that we would like to really emphasize here. Next slide, please. So here that we would like to really highlight the role of cities in reducing plastic pollution. And in this is immense. So designing and implementing functional and inclusive municipal solid waste management that can effectively affect the 75% of the plastic uh, waste management cannot be achieved only with a national policy, but also the enabling environments such as financial support and the capacity development for cities effective implementation. And then the plastic pollution from municipal solid waste management is largely occurring in the low to middle income countries. So those financial support for those, um, the, the gap, filling the gaps is very, very important. And the roles of cities and the local governments in reducing plastic pollution is immense. And then there should be the space for their voices to be heard in the negotiation and in providing insights for, on what enabling environment and support should be provided for cities uh, is really needed when designing a global instrument to end plastic pollution. Next slide, please. So this is the end of uh, my presentation. I hope I made it on time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much now for that very important framing of the issue, um, and especially for highlighting the low average recycling rate of 12.3% and the disproportionate impact of of plastic pollution on the urban poor. Those are really important things to keep in mind. As we now move on to our other speakers, um, I would like to invite everyone to kindly uh, turn on your um, cameras, uh, our distinguished speakers, um, so that we will better understand how collectively the different actors in the city can contribute to the global momentum towards a plastic treaty. Uh, I would like 
um, I would like to invite to the virtual stage. Uh, okay, we have everyone now. Um, we will be hearing today from a wide range of experts and city stakeholders. We have to start uh, Kosi Baker, Director of Waste Management and Regulation, Environment and Infrastructure Service Delivery from the city of Johannesburg. She will be presenting, re represent today and present the city of Johannesburg's challenges and actions to fight plastic pollution. We have both uh, Solidad Melia Vidal uh, from the Global Alliance of Waste Pickers and Barbara Weber, uh, co-founder and Glitter Program Manager of Ground Score Association. Welcome to you both. And of course, my uh, colleague, Brenda Kukuk, Program Manager of the Circle of Excellence on Plastic Pollution of the UN Environment Program. Bar uh, Brenda will tell us, um, will speak to us a bit more on the Plastics Treaty. And finally, last but not least, um, Magesh Naidu, Head of Circular De Development of ICLE Local Governments for Sustainability, who will provide us with closing remarks. So we, we start from the ground <laughs> with, um, with Kosi. Kosi, could you please tell us a little bit more, uh, building on the global uh, framing that now already put, uh, tell us more about the measures taken by uh, Johannesburg to improve the waste management services and ultimately reduce plastic pollution in the city. Kosi, over to you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, and good morning and good afternoon, everyone. It's afternoon in South Africa. Um, um, I would like to share with you uh, what is it that we are doing as Jobek in trying to improve on our recycling and especially uh, plastic um, uh, recovery um, as the city. Next slide. <clears throat> Uh, this is just this quick stat about Jobek. You are, we are a city of about 5 million uh, uh, people um, and about 1.8 million um, formal household and over 300 informal, house, informal households. We, we have a, a city-owned entity that is called Pick It Up that does our operations. And we generate around about 1.6 million tons of waste. And currently we are recycling about 15% of that um, tonnage that we, we, we generate on an annual basis. We, <clears throat> sorry, we, we have uh, four landfill sites and that are currently operational and combine these landfill sites are, are, are less with three years of landfill space. But we also have 42 recycling facilities that we that are open to cooperatives and, and also informal waste um, a, a recyclers. We have an estimate of about over 6,000 informal waste recyclers in the city. Next slide, please. <clears throat> This is just a quick uh, uh, stat, uh, report that was done by Plastic SA. The country generates over 1.7 million tons of plastic waste, and we only um, uh, currently um, uh, recycling about 43% of, 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 the, of the plastic waste that is generated in the country. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the South African government is, uh, has developed a number of policies to try and, and, and um, uh, uh, improve and also to try and promote um, waste recovery and, and, and recycling. Our Department of Environment and Fisheries um, did develop an international waste management strategy in 2020, which, is very, which has got a very strong focus on um, on on um, on on separation at source and and waste minimization, and after that, uh, the national uh, department also uh, developed producer responsibility um, uh, regulations that came into into effect um, on the fifth of November twenty twenty one, and the aim of these regulations is to rather encourage uh, or force the producers of um, uh, certain waste streams, plastic included, to put in systems in place to make sure that these um, uh, waste streams are recovered uh, for, for recycling. As Jobek, then we take the cue from the 
from the national policy. We then have our own integrated waste management policy and a plan which is very clear and has set clear goals and targets on waste diversion um, and, and, and recycling. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, this, this is the progress to date on the project we, that we are developing with the Alliance uh, to End Plastic Waste and, and, and Green Cape. This project uh, has got a number of outcomes in it, but for today, I'll only just um, a, a report on the progress that has been achieved for the first phase in, uh, for, of this project and the outcomes of this project. This project is looking at putting infrastructure in, 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 in Johannesburg that will, that will support waste minimization and, and, and waste collection or, or waste recovery, but also is looking at core um, a, a generation um, a, a, a of, of such projects with, especially with this, with a special focus to the, to the, um, a, a, informal waste 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 um, a, a recyclers so 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 far um, this project we have gone on a data collection we have already identified a pilot area for 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 the city uh, which is the 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 I think it's the north eastern suburb of the city and the reason for this particular choice of 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 a pilot area is because the northern suburbs of the city or the northern side of the city is actually developing at a very high rate, and it's it's mostly dense, um, uh, 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 populated uh, with high rise buildings and. Uh, <clears throat> That kind of settlements. So, with that kind of of, of urban growth, you will then um, uh, anyway have more high densities. Will then generate more volumes of waste in a very small space. So, data collection on available plastic on waste has been has been done. Uh, we have com completed also the waste characterization where we looked at the municipal waste stream for the city in that catchment area and and see how much of the plastic waste uh, of even of different recyclables uh, is composed in the in the in the in the waste stream we have also looked at the survey uh, of the reclaimers that are active in that area and the cooperatives that are actively involved and participating in the in the in the in the recovery in that area and also the number of buyback centers or facilities that exist uh, within the area that has been quantified and we've identified which ones of these facilities we're going to start um uh, working on and utilizing them for this said project um the survey of the of the co ops and and co-ops and the drop-offs facilities and also trying to aggregate the numbers of the of the active waste um, uh, reclaimers in relation to the number and the capacity of the facilities that we have in the area. And then, um, then thereafter we then, uh, I think what is left now on, on these is to develop the satellite aggregation model, which we, this is what you're currently busy with now to try and link every recycler to a specific site and looking at the infrastructure that exists and the equipment that they might use, they might need uh, for, the, for the primary processing of, of, of these recyclables or of the plastic in this case. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the, the the challenges in this um, uh, 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 pro program, or, or or in the in the waste minimization and recycling space for for local government or for local government sector is is working with the informal sector. The informal sector thinks it's more or less used to work as, as individuals, and when you try to get get them under a formalized structure. And, and put in rules and regulations, you some, sometimes get reluctancy uh, from, from, from their side. But lack of funding also with local government, especially for developing countries, at local government, we battling with a lot of other municipal services that actually take more priority when it comes to decision-making than just waste minimization. So lack of funding, uh, as, as John is we started a long time ago with separation of source, but there has been inconsistency in the in, in the funding that makes it difficult to sustain um, uh, the program um, uh, uh, to sustain anything also that uh, like education awareness that is meant 
to, to improve or to raise more awareness so that the, the, the program can, can, can improve and more and more people can, can, can participate. So uh, for the number of years that we have implemented separation at source, we have found that, that more and more, less and less um, a, a, a citizens are, are participating, which is uh, mm -hmm. due to the lack of education and awareness and consistency in, in that area. But also the, the fluctuation in, in, the, in, the, in the recycling uh, price, um, uh, these commodities, they, they compete in the market just like any other. And um, when the markets go down, then they find themselves back into a residual waste stream. Um, but also lack of public and private partnership. I believe that the private sector, I think uh, like Neo just said that um, a, a, a number of cities, especially in developing countries, uh, recycling is mostly driven by the informal sector. But um, mm -hmm. the informal sector that is supporting a very big, thriving formal sector recycling um, industry with very much less, um, I would say, participation or mm -hmm. even support for the informal sector coming from the private sector, big companies, especially South Africa. If I make an example, we have a multi-million, if not billion, recycling industry, but um, <clears throat> If you look at what is it that they're putting on the ground to support the informal sector that is bringing the, the recyclables at their doorsteps, it's, 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 it's very little. And um, policies have been uh, put, regulations have been promulgated, but there's very little that we see from the public-private partnerships, including the formal uh, private sector and the informal uh, private sector recycling industry. Okay. I think that, that that's all. That's that's far. Thank you. Thank you, Kosi. And and I think your last slide actually speaks really, really well uh, to our next speakers because you know uh, as you were presenting, I you were I was coming up with a lot of questions. Um, I, I want to know how the cooperatives work, for example. Um, so but, so thank you very much, and I hope a few of the uh, we will be able to have time in the question and answer. Um, so. Now uh, we will move on to uh, Soledad and uh, Barbara from the Global Alliance of Waste Vickers. Um, Soledad and Barbara, uh, I don't see Barbara in this on the screen. Ah, there you are. Uh, Barbara, could you, Soledad, could you tell us more about the crucial role of waste pick pickers and the informal waste sector in the fight against uh, plastic pollution? Kosi already provided a bit of a segue to this discussion, so it would really be uh, wonderful to hear more from you. Who wants to start? Soledad. Sí, buenos días. Buenos días. Se escucha bien. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Sí. So first of all, I would like to say good morning, good afternoon, good. And I know there are several countries here. I'm a recycler since more than 17 years ago. Our waste recollection history goes back so many, so many years ago, and most of our countries globally are now in the fourth or even fifth generation of re recollectors that have um, recycled residues and mainly plastic. I believe that in Nairobi and in Kenya, it was recognized the importance of workers and their contribution around informal works and cooperatives. The recollection and, res and reclassification of plastics and also it was recognized experience acquired and best practices. Why I do mention this and what I am, am I speaking about Nairobi? Because I think this is the start of the recognition and validation and also the historic depth that we have with recollectors in the whole world. When we talk about contribution and what is being done globally in countries in order to stop pollution by plastic. I think us recollector 
have made an historic contribution by avoiding that millions of tons end up in <coughs> seas, oceans, in the field, and in cities. Our contribution is because of the need that we have. Because we are the lowest side of the society. And through this, we invented our own job. We saw an economic opportunity, and that's why we have an important opportunity to sustain our households. So when we're talking about real and practical uh, and concrete practices, I think recollectors have done that. Without having an environmental scope or a clear scope of what's happening with residues. But currently today, we are very committed right now and we are very clear on what we have done so far. If you have asked me 10 years ago, what was our contribution, environmentally speaking, maybe we wouldn't be able to explain what we have done so far. But now we do know. We do know about our contribution. Now, today, recollectors, we look for an important and clear opportunity in, uh, in, in the face of this plastic treaty by understanding this historic debt and the value of what, that we have done so far. And we have uh organized ourselves we have gathered right now then we have uh, managed to set an international alliance when we incorporate more than 38 countries where we have different recollectors globally speaking and these are from different continents in the whole world we are uh, having our own alliance of recollectors and this has allowed us to have a very clear scope and to be very critical in front of what is happening regarding the overproduction of plastics and also the consequence that this may have, mainly in us and our health. And we have realized about that this last year because this uh, topic about pollution for plastics is having an impact in our co-workers that are recollecting. Looking at the different uh, presentations that has been introduced today, show the big amount of women that we are here working in this. More than 70% globally are women recollecting. So our contribution to this process has been a historic labor that just need a just transition. And why do we emphasize, emphasize this? Because we believe that all treaty before the vulnerabilities that we have had of human rights that we have in so many years now must be based on a just transition by showing that this process may be binding with real inclusion policies that are very concrete. And also we have shown in the two uh, different talks we have had that, uh, what are the percentages of recollection in each one of the countries in, and even globally, and this has been done thanks to us. This is an invisible task that nobody has been able to put a value into it. If we have to quantify the value of somebody that is recollecting for more than 60 years, just tons and tons just one recollector, a country wouldn't be able to pay for that service. When we talk about economic contribution, us recollectors in the world have subsidized each one of the different municipalities where this recollection has been does, done. Us Thanks. recollectors have uh, made a research about this. And now today we have the chance to talk about improvements for recollectors. And um, that's why we are asking for finance, training, and this is through education. We require basic technical and technological education to improve the situation. And last, we need the government and policies that been implementing in each one of the countries are really inclusive and that are, are not setting aside recollectors that have been the pioneers of recollections, of recollection mm -hmm. of plastics, and we have contributed with the environment in a, such a very important way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Soledad.
that was a very passionate intervention. Uh, you went a little bit over time, but we didn't. I didn't want to interrupt because it was so rich. Over to you, Barbara. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, good day to everybody. It's there's various time zones here. Uh, my name is Barbara Weber, and I've been working as a waste picker for 38 years of my life. And since 2001, I've been official delegate on the International Alliance of Waste Pickers to the Global Plastics Treaty. I'm the co-founder and glitter program manager for Ground Score Association, a peer-led initiative of Trash for Peace uh, in Portland, Oregon, United States. In 2019, I co-founded Ground Score Association, an association of informal recyclers and other environmental workers who create and fill low barrier waste management jobs. Uh, we created the People's Depot, a ground score independent bottle redemption service that was born out of the COVID pandemic. Piloted in April of 2020, it serves over two, 271 people each week and generates regular work for over 25 people who sort cans and plastic bottles Monday through Friday. This program is challenged by the fact that the EPR implement, implementation is consolidated under the producers. So we cannot advance from waste pickers to management of depots unless producers are willing to fund us. And even then, we are only limited to operating two hours a day, and our funding is not based on the amount of materials we produce, which is quite high. In February 2021, Ground Score Association piloted its glitter program, which provides doorstep waste collection to services to informal settlements of unhoused communities. The COVID-19 pandemic resulted in dramatic increase of homelessness, as well as illegal dumping of household waste by house residents. The result of the buildup of litter and formal dump sites across the city has deepened the stigma against the unsheltered and exasperated public health and environmental pollution. The glitter program formalized by obtaining local government contracts and transitioned 30 informal workers to formal employment and daily we hire informally out of a pool of 80 to 200 waste pickers, many of whom are also unhoused, to provide regular waste collection at informal settlements across the city. Last month, the team collected over 50 tons of waste, which would otherwise would have been burned or incinerated. <clears throat> the members of the International Alliance of Waste Pickers come from poor and humble and marginalized backgrounds, working class and survivors of abuse and violence, a race racial caste, and religious and ethnic minorities and, and indigenous communities. Due to the nature of our work, we are exposed to hazardous working conditions, including the exposure to air, water, soil pollution, and severe weather conditions. These working conditions are taking a toll on, on our health. With climate change becoming a day-to-day -day reality, the average temperatures are increasing and frequent floods because of erratic rains. These events make us vulnerable to many more health risks of our loss of our livelihood and income. Other risk of our livelihood of increased privatization of waste management and waste energy and other public policies and interventions in plastic waste management, including the omission of our work and the norms of extended producer responsibility. Even then, we are not disheartened. We create work for ourselves by engaging in waste picking and recycling. Our work in recycling is, con is contributing to the reduction of plastic pollution and lower carbon emissions and strengthening the circular economy. A plan for a just transition will provide a guaranteed and decent work and social protection and more training opportunities and greater security for workers at all stages of the plastic value chain, including workers under the informal and cooperative settings, including waste pickers and all workers affected by plastic pollution. Thank you. Apologies, I was on mute. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, Last but not least, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give the floor now to my colleague, um, Brenda. Brenda, uh, can you tell us about the historic uh, resolution for a future plastics treaty and the negotiation process involved? And more importantly, can you uh, give us some uh, guidance on how local authorities and the informal waste sector can be meaningfully engaged in this process? Over to you, Brenda. Great, thank you so much, Sharon. Um, and thank you for inviting us today to present. Uh, I think it's a very important session and an, a very important um, sector and community in the global negotiation process. So if we just go to the first slide, 
Um, I just wanted to take you back to the first session of the Intergovernmental uh, Negotiating Committee that took place at the end of 2022. So next slide. Um, it's from the, it took place from the 28th of November to the 2nd of December in Punta del Este, Uruguay. Um, Ambassador Gustava Medra Kudra from Peru was elected as the chair, and there were over 1,400 participants at INC1, so it's a strong uh, commitment, 147 states and the EU, uh, 10 IGOs and 409 NGOs were registered. So there were strong opportunities for um, stakeholders to contribute through a stakeholder dialogue, um, through a stakeholder forum that all brought very many voices to the table. And we as a secretariat are currently working with the chair of the process to ensure successful stakeholder modalities to engage at INC2 and onwards. All of the meeting documentation is available on our website. I can drop those links into the chat following my discussion here. Um, and there was full coverage of the meeting that gave more of the political nuances from the Earth Negotiations Bulletin as well. Next slide. So I just wanted to highlight here a uh, timeline of the INC process that's lying ahead of us. Uh, you'll see it's a very ambitious, ambitious timeline because we need to wrap up these negotiations according to the RENEA resolution by the end of 2024. Um, and we as a secretariat within UNEP are um, set to plan four more negotiating sessions over the course of the two years coming up. Um, and we will report into our governing body in February of 2024. Um, so INC2 is planning is fully underway. Uh, we are planning this meeting uh, hosted by the government of France. Uh, the location will be at the UNESCO headquarters in Paris. Um, and the meeting will be held from the 29th of May to the 2nd of June. Uh, regional meetings will take place on the 28th of May. Um, and France is planning to host a high level event on the 27th of May. This will be fully organized by the government of France uh, and details will follow from them. Next slide, please. Um, I wanted to highlight a few key considerations from INC1, um, a few points. So really there was a reiteration of the need for an instrument to address the full life cycle of plastics, protecting human health and the environment, and special attention really was paid to the unique stance, circumstances of those countries most in need. Um, there was a, a discussion on clarity and the scope of the objective uh, and the scope of the instrument before moving towards discussions on specific obligations in the instrument. There was widespread recognition of that national action plans will be a critical component. This was also highlighted in the resolution. Um, and a consistent call to ensure that developing countries are able to actively participate through the entire process. Uh, we saw a real highlight of the inclusion of all relevant stakeholders, uh, particularly those in the informal sector, um, and we really urge that continuation of involvement. Uh, we also do see a recognition of the role of local governments in this process and would uh, continue uh, that support. Next slide. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of documents that were provided to INC1 uh, as background information, because we are starting to see some of this information come forward to us in uh, submissions that are coming from governments, etc. Um, we did highlight uh, through our plastic science document, document 17, uh, at the INC, four strategic goals to guide the transition to a circular economy. Um, so those four strategic goals uh, list are include reducing the size of the problem by eliminating and substituting problematic and unnecessary plastic items, including hazardous additives, um, ensuring that plastic products are designed to be circular, reusable as a first priority and recyclable or, or compostable after multiple uses, closing the loop of plastics in the economy, uh, and finally, man managing plastics waste, waste that cannot be reused or recycled, including existing pollution. Um, so these are, are key um, drivers, but they're also key opportunities uh, for, uh, for the future in terms of uh, new opportunities for the economy as well. Now, moving to the next slide. Uh, I just wanted to highlight the road to Paris for INC2. Um, I just touched on it at the beginning, um, but the INC Secretariat will launch a call for side events for INC2 very soon. 
We can expect that one of the 12 side events that we will be proposing will be uh, related to the informal sector. So please be ready for that. I think an another will be on waste management. So those will be key opportunities for your community to engage in the process. The documents for the INC process will be made available by the 17th of April. This is six weeks ahead of the meeting. And the registration for INC2 is now open until the 28th of April. So all registration needs to be processed through our Indigo portal. Um, and any questions you have uh, can be answered by the, the, from the emails that are here on the screen. Just to be take note in terms of participation, one of the um, criticisms we received at INC1 was engagement. And we do wanna indicate that there is enough funding for the Secretariat to fund two delegates per developing country to participate in the meeting and 20 NGOs in the process. So I think that's a, um, a signal of higher level of engagement and promise in the system. Um, next slide, please. So I just wanna talk about the key document will, that will be inputted into the INC2 process. Um, the INC Secretariat, uh, we were asked to prepare a document with potential options for elements towards an international legally binding instrument. This document's to be based on a comprehensive approach that addresses the full life cycle of plastic and considers the UNEA resolution. And it's to include the objective substantive provisions, including core obligations, control measures, and voluntary approaches, implementation measures, and means of implementation. And it's to be drafted in consultation with the chair. So there was a call for written submissions that was launched and the secretariat received 176 submissions from stakeholders and 67 written submissions from member states. So we received a lot of input and the paper is to be based um, on the member state submissions and discussions at INC1. Uh, this paper, along with the others, will be made available on the 17th of April for participants. Next slide, please. Um, now, just before I close off, I just wanted to highlight one of the documents that we prepared for INC1, which was document 11, that identified challenges and barriers at national level um, and particularly um, it was done through uh, the stages of the life cycle. So I just thought I would highlight the points that came forward that we um, had collected for challenges and barriers at the downstream phase um, linked to waste management and local level. Um, so these were lack of legislation, technology, infrastructure, capacity and investment, lack of knowledge at the household level. So leading to poor sorting of plastic waste, poor collection and segregation, lack of industrial pro recycling processes, lack of recognition of the proximity principle, uh, lack of regulation and fiscal policy requiring uh, accountability from producers, presence of the informal sector, open burning and dumping of plastic waste in uncontrolled circumstances. So I think these things all resonate and I just wanted to highlight that they were, they were put forward to the INC process uh, and can be elaborated upon in moving forward uh, in a deeper and more nuanced way that's more relevant to your community. So next slide to just close off, I just uh, wanna say uh, that local governments and the informal sector of course play a key role um, uh, in the instrument and the governments particularly in implementing and enforcing it. Um, there was a strong highlight even from the resolution and directly into the discussion on the need for stakeholder engagement in the instrument. And there was particular reference to the informal waste sector. We were glad to see strong participation at INC1 from the sector. Um, there is a strong view that local governments understand these issues and there is a, a lot at stake on the ground. Um, so I just wanted to pose a few questions that I'd be happy to hear more thoughts from any of you on and feel free to connect me as a, connect with me as we close off here. Um, how do you want to be involved? What can you commit in terms of action? And what do you need to see in the future instrument to solve the problem of uh, the plastic pollution in cities? So thank you. Thank you, Brenda, for kicking off the question and answer. In yeah, fact. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a uh, uh, so. Just to, before we allow our uh, last and only male speaker, as Soledad pointed out, <laughs> to close, um, we do have a little bit of time for question and answer. And I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Elsa, who has been in the background looking at the questions in the chat uh, to um, give us a few questions for the 
for our speakers to respond to. Elsa? Yes, hi, and thank you very much, um, Sharon, for giving me the floor. If I might ask all our speakers to turn on their camera in case the question is directed to them, that would be great. So first of all, um, thank you very much for your interest. There, there are lots of questions in the chat. We've been trying to respond to some of them already in writing because we won't be able, I think, to touch on um, a few of them, especially the one that are really technical on how to recycle some types of plastics, etc. It's it's definitely extremely important, but um, um, we we won't be able to focus on this. We had also quite a few questions related to financing financing instruments. There there is already a response uh, type in the chat uh, related to this, so I think we 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 might not cover it because first I would like to. Um, to give the floor uh, very briefly to uh, Camilia Kemileva from the Geneva Cities Hub because uh, she um, made a request for um, outlining some of the possible contribution from local government to the treaty process and might be responding to a few of the questions Brenda just asked. So, um, Camilia, I think you should be able yeah. to. I am. About. Yeah. Thank you, Antha. Good morning, everyone. And I made an official promise to stick to two minutes to Sharon and Elsa, so I will absolutely fulfill it. Geneva City Hub is a diplomatic initiative. It's not a city network, but we work very closely with cities. We work very closely with our friends from ICLE and others. So let me get directly to the, to the question in a nutshell and without coordination. Uh, replying to Brenda, because we, we talk to Brenda very often also. So we said cities and local and regional governments should engage, but how they can engage in what is basically a traditional state-driven uh, negotiation, uh, which is quite open to external stakeholders, as Brenda and, 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 and others mentioned, but still the heart of the negotiation remains in, in uh, state hands. So first of all, uh, based on these uh, submissions, and by the way, UNEP, really great idea to allow these written submissions. This is for me a game changer. I'm, I'm you know, a traditional uh, diplomat for 20 years. I haven't seen such a well-organized process. Uh, so really kudos to UNEP to organize this written submission website. So we have done um, you know, an evaluation of the written submission of states and once again, as it is a state-driven negotiation, local and regional governments need to engage with state, states. And the good news is that approximately 10 states, which are Norway, Armenia, Nepal, also Indonesia, Philippines, Argentina, Canada and Turkey, uh, we will publish this on our website, I will send you the reference. They have mentioned the role and the, 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 the possibility of engagement with local and regional governments. So our first reply to the question is to say that please look at the written submission of the states. Again, we will publish them, they are public on the website of UNEP. Those who have mentioned local and regional governments and uh, engage, speak with them. The second possibility is uh, to continue to exchange, obviously, on the, on the website of UNEP or other websites, concrete proposals, how local and regional governments can engage not only into the negotiations, but also in the implementation of the, of the treaty. And since the treaty is legally binding only for states, that's are the rule of the international uh, you know, um, public law, the voluntary commitments which can be scheduled through the treaty and the voluntary commitments which can be foreseen as implementation of the treaty uh, can also concern local and regional governments. We'll have other occasions to speak. I have fulfilled my two minutes. Uh, very happy to reply to questions. I will publish the reference uh, in the chat and uh, share an answer. Thank you again for giving me the floor uh, briefly, but uh, efficiently, I hope, uh, in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Camilla. And yes, please um, send me links and I can post them through the through the chat. Um, I think we are unfortunately 
running out of time. So I would like to ask our speakers if you can look at the Q&A and take as many responses in writing as you can. And, and ending over to you, Sharon, for the, the last part. Thank you. No more time, but Magesh, please share your thoughts on and, and give us a bit of a closing for, for this session. Thanks, Sharon. And it's always uh, tricky to speak at the end, especially with such esteemed and, uh, you know, so much of expertise um, on, on the call. So I think it's just to, just to mention, it's great to hear that stakeholder engagement is being planned for to be more robust for INC2. So we look forward to that. Just three major points from my side. I think the first being cities are always at the forefront of um, positive and negative uh, situations. There's always this integration that cities find revolving around themselves due to the world being so interconnected. So while we're focusing on the plastics conundrum, I think it's also important to keep in mind the unforeseen circumstances and start planning for these. I mean, just to use a very specific example, would there be a delay in, in hospitals because there are no sterile gloves um, as, as, as a negative consequence, right? So how do these then start being planned for outside of just specifically talking about the plastics yeah, conundrum? But also at the same time, cities are putting a huge kind of investment into infrastructure. We heard from Mukosi and city of Cape Town. So what happens to this infrastructure when kind of plastics, uh, the feedstock starts, starts decreasing? So lots of complexities that I think cities need to take into account. The second part, again, leading to uh, linking to rather this notion of integration is really about the just transition and the economic implications. So we've heard from Soledad and from Barbara um, some sobering insights. And we need to ensure that as, well, we're ultimately wanting to, to stem this flow of plastic. And our, as this flow decreases, we want to ensure that there is some sort of just transition for informal jobs um, specifically, but also in the larger value chains um, of, of kind of the formal sector. So this, again, is think, something that I think that needs to come through, but more strongly. We could potentially see a situation like what we've seen with industrial legacy cities, maybe not to the same extent, but in smaller situations or scales in various cities where you have entire complexes then becoming you know, redundant, um, huge unemployment uh, materializing within well, from the sector. Um, and I think this then obviously exacerbates or could have the potential rather to exacerbate financial uh, distressed pockets of, 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 of residents and especially coming out of COVID. The last part um, is regarding coordination of cities voices. So um, I think ICLE along with UCLG play very prominent roles in the LAMG space and we have been strategizing uh, on how best to, to approach this. So it's important for us to further our insights into cities, um, what's, what's currently happened, so we can synthesize the current messaging to help us you know, lobby and um, undertake this, this messaging correctly. So we have just launched a survey for cities. If we could, um, I think this is, will come up in the chat um, shortly. If we can have insight from cities, this will further, you know, help us shape our messaging um, and so on and so forth. And just last point, I just haven't, I guess, had the time to cover all of the uh, points I wanted to raise. But on the specific last point, I guess we're here under the banner of urban shift. And I guess circularity and circular development is a huge uh, topic or part of the plastics discussion. And we will then be launching the circular development course in the coming weeks through the urban shift program. So uh, then I guess the ask here is to keep an eye out for this course. So so with that, um, Sharon, maybe I hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Magesh. Uh, indeed, a very, very rich discussion. Um, we are at time now. So I hope the discussion was as useful to you as it was 
to us. Um, we will be following up with the questions if we're not answered. And as Magash said, uh, we have the survey and the urban shift training to look forward to. And we in UNEP are uh, on standby for other questions particular to the Plastics Treaty. The Urban Shift webinar series will continue in a few months, and we hope to see you again in this space for other um, topics. Please sign up for our newsletter and connect with us on social media shown on screen to stay informed on Urban Shift activities. Thank you very much to my colleagues, especially Elsa and Margot, who have been uh, really the, doing the heavy lifting in organizing this webinar. Thank you very much and have a good day. Bye everyone. Thank you, bye. Oh, gracias. Thank you speakers.